You're listening to the After The Show Movie Podcast brought to you by ascully.com. And here are your hosts, A. Scully and Sid Talk. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, Sid Talk. Yes. How are you? I'm sorry, I'm just, I was distracted. Well, it's time to <laughs> not be distracted and pay, <laughs> pay attention. attention. Pay I'm paying attention. attention now. All right, pay attention what to the What was the, the show. question? How are you? I'm fine. How um, are you, listeners? Are you fine? Are we going to wait for them to answer? Yeah. Hold on, let me hear. Hold on. Okay. Oh, yeah, I can hear a couple of them saying... Uh, Very good. We have new technology that we're not sharing with the world, so we can hear you live. Oh, wait, that technology has already been existed. I mean, invented, and we have five of them in our house. Someone listening at all times. Yeah, we do. Spying. Spying <laughs> on us. Hey, you know what? Knock yourself out. Was the any before the after the show? Discuss- oh, we're discussing this movie. Correct. And we were looking at some interviews with the director. So we'll discuss that when we get to the movie. So it is Saturday, January the 12th. This is after the show number Jeez, five. this year's just flying by. After the show number 565. We are a podcast. We review movies. We've reviewed 565 of them at least because maybe we re- reviewed two in an episode sometimes. Mm, true. So um, the movie we're looking at this week is mid-90s. It's a 2018 release. It's available on Blu-ray now. It's rated R. It's from our friends at A24 and Lionsgate. They sent us a copy for review on Blu-ray. And Sid Tart will give you the synopsis of the movie, mid-90s. Mm, it's about some kid in the mid-1990s. <laughs> Particularly one kid. A young child boy. Falling in with the crowd of skaters and all of the follies that come with that. Lots well, of references to the 1990s. 1990s, by the way. That would be the 20th century, boys and girls. Back in the 1900s. Yeah. Now, Just to put in context. Now, me and you did not grow up in the 1990s. We did not grow up in the 90s, no. So we, we, know, we can see this is a coming-of-age story, but it's out of our decade. We were already grown up. <laughs> So, we well, you know, some would argue that, but yes. But me and you did experience the 1990s. Or you and I, because your grammar is starting to really get True. on my little nerve there. True. You and I. <laughs> now, please, anyone pull me up on any grammatical errors that I make. Yeah, I'm the sure there are none That'll be from you. fine. But me and you has, you know, always... The grammar police are in action. That'd be fine. You know what? That's fine. Tell me what I'm saying wrong. All right. Just tell me what I'm saying wrong. <laughs> All right, so yeah, we didn't. Um, I obviously didn't grow up in. Where where is this movie set? Well, let's California. just uh, let's tell them we were born. I was born in 1967, and you were born in 1969. Therefore, our growing up period was the 70s and the early 80s, and then we were teenagers and blah blah blah. So our coming of age is early 80s, 80s, right at the 79, 80, 81 for me, up through 86 when I graduated from high school. That's when I think of your coming of age years. So this movie is, a, I, th- I think, a coming-of-age story of a boy in... We got, it's California, right? Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's undefined, it's, I think, but it's like L.A., Santa Monica type of place. Yeah. But I don't know. There may be landmarks that people would say, well, that's obvious it's whatever city. Or maybe they said it, but I didn't catch it. No, I don't think they said it because I, I kept thinking, where exactly is this? Anyway. Um, but I always associate skateboarding culture from the 90s to be in California, and I do not know why. I do too, because there was like Santa Cruz skateboards, and you know, it was all. See, I don't even know anything around. about it. And still, I think it's just the clips of videos I see of the boys doing it back in the 90s were all with palm trees in the background and yeah, true. lots of LA references. So, so this is, a, this is um, let me start by saying I really love this movie. You know I did, right? Mm hmm. Because. Whatever this type of movie is, this, I like them a lot. <laughs> we were trying to establish what type it's of movie this is. Hard to define. <laughs> it's um, it has a particular style about it. It uses music in a particular way, and um, it's very raw and real to me. Like it, it's you know, it's you could say it's 
well, it is scripted because we just listened to mm-hmm. the director talk, but it feels like people having a real conversation. Yeah, it's not a documentary. No, no. It's a drama story, but there's something a bit more real about it when you watch it. It doesn't feel mm-hmm. 100% like it's always being acted. Some of it feels ad-libbed. I'm sure it, it feels like it definitely is to me. Yeah. So it's about this young guy called Stevie. And he's, how old is it? What, what's his age? I don't know. I, no he's a small guy. Like, do you think he's like 11? Yeah, it feels like 11 years old to me. Right, so... Maybe he's a, 12? Yeah. Or maybe a small 13? I don't know. He's not a very big I mean, he's just dude. a very small, kind of scrawny <laughs> little guy. He's like, a little dude. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, he's in this very adult world. Like, he, I mean, the movie starts off with his... With him getting slammed into a wall, basically. By his idiot fucking brother. Yeah, by his brother. God. So it's not a nice home life he's got. And he's looking for something outside of home life to be happy with. And that's what I really liked about this movie a lot. You, Even though you might be thinking while you're watching it, and I don't know, you know, if you're a parent, for instance, you might be like, oh my Ooh, God, this kid. It's what's, a bit what's scary. This? So this kid, like, you know, he's... he's trying to form ideas. He's looking at what his brother's music is and like, he's just, you know, he's getting ideas and then he sees these skaters and he's like, now you might disagree, but do you think he's like, those are skaters. I just, they're just cool. I want to be that. Or do you think he's into the skating or do you think it's more the idea of it? Every time it shows him smiling up close, you understand he just wants to belong and this feels right. Right. And I don't know what that is for him, but I mean, as you know, we've all, we've all it, hopefully all experienced that where you're living your life, you haven't been exposed to a thing, and then all of a sudden you are. <laughs> like, it could be anything. In this situation, it happens to be older boys who are doing drugs, smoking weed, smoking crack, I think. I don't know. Drinking, skating, taking pills, taking pills, um, messing around with girls at parties, you know, well, young women. That's what he's never been exposed to in a way where he's just him on his own person. Yeah. You know, his mom's not there, his idiot brother's not there, whatever else he's leaving behind, it's just him and it fulfills something in him. And I remember going to college and I lived in a a town that had less people than the dorm that I moved into when I went to college. And I remember, even though I had a horrible roommate when I first moved to college, I remember walking down the halls and like hearing all the different things going on in all the rooms and hearing people talk and walking past and seeing all the different kinds of people. And I just felt this like, (gasps) oh, like, I don't even know how to describe it. For me, I'm no now. It's because nobody knew me. I didn't have to like, pretend or fake anything no one expected anything and that's just a thing for me i don't like being part of a group and in a small town you're part of a group for so for me when i saw that little smile on his face a lot yeah when he would like sit in the car with them and he goes this is the first time i've ever been in a car with somebody without their parents you know and it's just like that feeling of wow of independence and like well, exposure to something new, of course. So I totally get that. I do like um, some of the things I liked is when he wants to be, you know, he sees these guys and he and then he goes into the skate shop that they work in. I guess one of them works in that there, right? Not, I, get, I couldn't quite figure it out because they no. kind of abandoned it like the quick shop <laughs> in a yeah in a what's it called clerks oh clerks duh. Yeah, so like, the, the, you know, I, I'm assuming one of them works in the skate shop, they, but they hang around in the skate shop like people do. And he goes in the skate shop and he's just looking around while while listening to them and you can see the smile on his face. Oh, these are people I want to be with. Like, Yeah, because it's kind of wild and raw and... They're very irreverent. They, they, what they say is not very PC. They, <laughs> they say... Just no, talking, yeah, just talking. The conversation talking. that they're having when he first goes into the store is about... Do you remember what it's about? Yes. Yeah, it's very near the knuckle, like so. Yeah. And he's like, "Wow, these kids, they, they're cool." I, I, who, who talks like that? You know, he's looking and smiling, and I kept getting that from him, like the smile, like. Yep, that when, was very prominent. Then when he got his first skateboard, you know, 
when he got accepted by a couple of the guys, like they they're like, well, you're, you know, he's a lot smaller than them and he's younger than them, but they accept him for what he is. Like, well, at first, <laughs> one of the guys says, "Can you just fill my water bottle up?" And this kid's so like, <laughs> I want to be with these guys. I think we can all identify with that too, sadly. He went and filled the bottle up with a big smile on his face like, yes, I'm in. <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh my God. When he did the, barely did a trick on his skateboard. And barely, he was losing yeah. his mind. Oh my God. I totally identify with that emotion. that Because he was trying so hard to be as good as them. And he just bare. I mean, he still fell. Yeah. Or something. and it, But it was, he, and then he was like, yes, <laughs> yes. And he's out there by himself just like celebrating it. And I'm like, I I think this movie and the way of these young men, mostly young men, portray these things is really right. You know, it's it's it, it feels right. Yeah. And sometimes it's a bit uncomfortable to listen to, and sometimes True. um I read a thing um what Jonah Hill was saying. Um they use the F uh, uh, the F word, but the derogatory term for gay mm-hmm. w- beginning with F. <laughs> they use that quite a bit in the movie and Jonah Hill got some criticism about it and he said that growing up people taught like that around him and he went to um the producer the produ- one of the producers of the movie who's actually gay and he said should I write a scene in this movie where the boys say to each other maybe we shouldn't say that to each other it's rude and the guy said that would be more offensive than them saying it because that, that conversation wouldn't have happened. That, yeah, exactly. Nobody, no kids would ever say that to each other. They hinted at the idea of this, um, I don't know, passing along use of language to each other where the young, there's like the group of older teens and there's one younger boy and now he's even younger than their youngest, you know, dude. He says thank you to the young dude for something and the youngest one says, man, don't say thank you. They'll think you're an F word and blah, blah, and like insulting him for saying thank you. Right. And then later the oldest kid's like, of course you can say thank you. That's it's just, just good. Yeah, it's just good manners. <laughs> like, yeah. but it's telling you that someone's appropriating language. You know what I mean? It kind of acknowledges that in a group, if you want to be accepted, sometimes you will take on language and then it becomes part of the culture of your group. Whatever it is. I think that was a kind of a nod to that. I don't know, but it seemed like... Because we didn't address using the N-word or talking about being gay. Because that's like... Until the last 10 years, that's been a very, very prominent insult. Right. In a lot of language in different groups of people. And so we're not addressing it directly because it wouldn't have been. No. That group of people in that day and age would wouldn't just have, say that. Yeah, and even yeah. now there's going to be a group of people like, fuck it, I can say whatever I want. And I don't disagree with that. But there's just a, we all have our own level of how we use words. And I think that if you took away any of that, even though you feel like, oh, it feels anxious to me. But what then is- I've always been that way. So about using language that I just don't. But it's what yeah. makes it feel more real when they when they're just having a conversation. I think it. I don't know if it's real because it seems excessive. Because I've never been around that specific kind of language, like amongst those types, like hip hoppy type of. Right. Yeah. However, I've been on. You know, they're using the N word constantly. Now I've been on the other end of the N word thing, where I've grown up with people, like I said, from a very very small town. And the culture of the small town where I'm from, not that all small towns are this, but was very N-word centric, but in the other way. (laughs) A constant flow of jokes and jabs and insults and blaming. And I mean constant. And so I understood it from that point of view. That it is, it can be completely filled in your language in a conversation. I just have never experienced in the urban way. Right. What I liked, or whatever um, it is, whatever they. What I liked is. about Stevie though is all these boys talk like that, and he never did. It's not like he. He didn't really. He just. Kinda, he didn't. He never said the n word. He he didn't want to become them. He was just comfortable being himself. I think because he wanted to be himself. He's a polite kid. He says thank you. I, mean, I don't know if he wanted to be himself necessarily because he ended up doing lots of drugs and drinking and sort of like it kind of was, you know. Yeah, but I, even the part where they're on the bus and he's the guy offers him a pill and he's like, can this harm me? 
But then he took it. So but, yeah, so I mean, but he was making his own decision. Like I, I yeah, I think you know, I want to see what this is. Like I want to try it. I want to try girls. I want to try. Like I'm, I'm just growing up. Like, but I'm not trying to be these boys. Because even that girl said, you know, how there's a there's a not being rude, but there's a character in this movie called Fuck Shit. And Correct. Then he's called that for a reason. Because he says it. Yeah. All the time. All the time. Yeah. But the girl who's trying to fish Stevie for some information about that guy is saying like, well, I know that he goes with girls and then ignores them until he wants them again. Right. But even Stevie doesn't try, doesn't fit, doesn't try to do that. Like be cool. Mm. Like his mate. Uh, not true. Cause as soon as he has his encounter, which I said is controversial for that young boy. There's to a be, sex scene. As soon as, but not fully a sex scene. I mean, they kissed and then they said some stuff. So we didn't, there was nothing else yeah. going on, but as soon as they he came out, he told them exactly what happened and he kind did. of laughing it off. So that was kind of jerky. And he was learning how to be a jerk. So there you <laughs> go. But, um, you know, he's growing up and the these kids are not... Uh, I was going to say they're not a great influence because they're not a lot of the time, are they? Yeah, Believe but, me. you know, you have to think about both both sides of it. I mean, you can say they're not a good influence, but then the combination of them, you know, if he's a, if you're a smart young man watching everybody, then you watch Ray, who's got his head on straight. You watch fuck shit, who, <laughs> who's kind of like lost, but really good heart, like really good. He's just, there's something going on there that keeps him, he just wants to party and forget everything all the time. Then you've got fourth grade, who's like the dude who's filming everything, who everybody thinks isn't very smart. And he's, He's not going along with all the things they do. So I think individually they offer something, you know, and then there's the youngest kid who he can kind of feel sorry for. Yeah, true. When he might end up feeling sorry for himself and kind of realizes what that guy tells him. There's a bit of friction in the group too yeah. because the um, youngest kid uh, before Stevie arrives you know, Stevie starts He's to like, take yeah. his place. Like <laughs> That's why I said the theme of this movie to me is resentment and how people build up a resentment in all kinds of ways in relationships. And in this one specifically, you have the older brother resentful that their mom has changed. Like she's a better mom now than she was before. So he's so resentful that he's violent toward the brother. Yeah. Then you've got the friends who are resentful One's wanting to go on and be successful while the other one wants to hang back and he's resentful of the other one's op- you know, opportunities. And then you've got the young kid resentful of the other young kid because now he's taking his place. I mean, it's all over the place, but it's so real because you hear it and see it in everyday life with everybody. So I really like that. Now, there's some really cool s- the scenes that I really like the best. One was Stevie went to a load of trouble to buy his brother a CD. Yep. He went in his room, which he wasn't supposed to. He wrote down all the music that his brother likes uh, in a deleted scene on this Blu-ray. You see him go to a store, pick up pick up a, a CD for his brother that he wouldn't have just to give him a cool present. And then when he gives it to his brother, how does his brother react? He sit, he's like a dickhead. He just, just sits on the table. He like just, it's yeah, him. unwraps it and very uninterested puts it down on the table. But he's got, that kid's got so much anger at the older brother against the mom. And I, I don't make excuses for people, but you can observe why people behave the way they behave sometimes. This is a fictional character, but it's very real. Yeah. That he is so angry with his mother for the way he was raised and now how she's trying to kind of pretend to be better. They takes it out on the brother and he can't show any joy or anything, you know, like goodness. And it takes his brother, you know, I won't say, but there is a moment when you think, well, maybe he's got hope. Yeah. Another scene which really struck me was when the, de- the guys in the skate shop decided to give Stevie his first proper skateboard. And the guy who was, you saw him like almost being like a craftsman, putting the tape on it. Oh, I love that. Screwed. I love that. Yeah, because it was... Because, you know, you might have the opinion, oh, they're just kids in a skate shop. They're, like, nothing. Like, they're lazy or whatever. Mm. This kid has got a skill. Like, he, you see him, like, he puts the grip tape on the top. I was hoping we'd see an extra about these guys because they were skating, to me, 
like they had skills. Yeah. Like for real, not just like faking their way through a movie kind of a thing. Yeah, and true. then that whole sequence, I was like, whoa, he's, yeah, you know, he's crafting yeah. a board together. Yeah, he, he, you see him screw the wheels. You know, it's like it's, it's like a guy who's done that a million times. But it, it was like a rite of passage to me. It was like, here's Stevie. Here's this. And he's it, watching so close. Like, he's yeah. like, I want to know how to do that. <laughs> here's the board that you're going to do your skateboarding on. It's You know, he had like a Ninja Turtles board before that. Just some cheesy board that he got off his brother. But here's your proper board. And you could see him. He was like wow, this is what I want to be, you know. And then things, I guess things take a bit of a dark turn. I'm not going to talk about the ending, but, mm. you know. There's, yeah. There's the scene at the party where he gets to be with the girl. And then, I mean, it's not a dark turn, but he is very young, right? Very young, very young. And she knows he's very young. <laughs> um, I don't know how old, well, she'd be what, like 18 maybe? Looks like, yeah. And he's, he's put, like we say, 11 or 12. So the, uh, so. the reason I think that's controversial is because if the roles were reversed and that was a 10-year-old girl right. with an 18-year-old boy, yeah, man, so that, that would be a problem. That scene did feel like you were like, ooh, ooh. Yeah, is, like, uh, you know? But I th- again, I think it was portrayed really well, that scene. I think it felt real again, like it, it was awkward and, you know, mm-hmm. interesting. And, you know, the... The whole journey of Stevie, there is a journey, I think. I've read people's reviews of this saying there's just nothing going on in this movie. There totally is a lot going on in this movie. This kid, like, I think he really, like, think about him in the beginning scene, being beat up by his brother, and then, you know, not oh, being... yeah. You know, there's a, he goes on a big growing up. He grows up, like, in front of your eyes with these kids. Even though he doesn't really grow up. Because it all takes place, what, over the... It's not over years and years and years. It's over, like, to me, like, months. Yeah. You know? A couple months, I think, is what he said when they asked how long he'd been friends with them. I like that scene where they're all skateboarding on this roof. And uh, there's, like, a hole in a roof. Oh, God. And it's quite a big (laughs) hole. I'm talking... And the, the, you know, the the two good skateboarder dudes are jumping across the hole on the thing. And I like that whole... Yeah, that was interesting. Because the younger kid says, what does he say to him that that spurs him to do it? Cause Nothing. The other one just wouldn't do it. Yeah, but it, it, it's like what he said spurred him to do it. Like That's why he just went barreling at the, at the hole. That was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, it's not an action film. There, that little portion is a bit of action, but it's not an action film. It's a, a drama coming of age thing. Movies like I like. Um Really awesome music. Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross did the score to this. So if you've seen the movie The Social Network, which they did the score to, it's similar to that, the actual incidental music. But then there's a lot of songs in here. There's like Morrissey. There's lots of rap music if you are a mid-90s rap person. There's Wu-Tang and, you know, stuff that... Sid Talk over there has no idea what it is. I was just thinking, I would have <laughs> no clue that that's even who it was. So, right. yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of hip-hop. Um, because hip-hop goes with the skating genre, you know? Like, mm-hmm. it's what hip-hop people... It's what skating kids listen to in the 90s. But there's even Morrissey, which I don't know if... There's Nirvana. I don't know if... Um, it almost felt like a mixtape. Like, somebody's mixtape. You know? It was just a hodgepodge of songs, and they were all pretty cool. I liked them all, even the rap songs. So um, there's that. It's got that going for it. Um, the way it looks is four by three, and it's all filmed on 16 millimeter film. So it looks grimy, and it's not not as sharp as you would uh, see a modern, like you know, Transformers or something. You know, it's super sharp. This is not. It looks kind of fuzzy. Are you comparing this to Transformers? <laughs> no. <laughs> but to a modern movie. It's, it's like fuzzy and it's 4 by 3 right? And that kind of adds to That sounds like a song. The, it's fuzzy and it's 4 by 3 It's but it, fuzzy and it's 4 by 3 But it doesn't, that doesn't make it um, like it's on home video. It doesn't feel like that, like you're no. watching a videotape. It's not that bad, but it's got... A, do you like that, the 4 by 3 Do you? I didn't even notice till about halfway through. I'll be honest. Hmm, so uh, it doesn't affect me. <laughs> I can see you know his why, I mean? because, you know, yeah, I can see he used 16 millimeter film. It is a 90s thing. We didn't have widescreen televisions in the 90s. 
Yeah, but there were no widescreen TVs in, you know, World War One, and we have World War One movies. So, I mean, I don't understand that logic except to try to be cool. I'll try to, you know, because this movie is going after the skate culture mm-hmm. and skate videos are a massive part of the skate culture and they, they're they all kind of fuzzy and <laughs> um, four by three, you know? So this movie, oh, this movie does um, have like a skate video at the end, doesn't it? One of the dudes produces mm-hmm. a skate video. I mean, thinking about it, you know, when you said like, you say they, you think they're skater dudes for real or whatever. They're not actually great at skateboarding, none of them. No? No. Seems like good to me. No, fairly average. Like, I've watched a lot of really good skate videos, and these kids are just average skaters. Like, Stevie, you don't really see skate much at all if you watch. He just Mm -hmm. goes up. He's There's a a portion uh, of the movie where they're just, like, skating down the middle of the street, but it's not stunts. It's just they're... Yeah. They're going in a straight line, pretty much. <laughs> but uh, you don't really see Stevie doing skate. It's not like a movie where he he gets into skateboarding and becomes Tony Hawk. No. It's just more of a normal story of a kid who's into skateboarding and the culture around it, and that's just how he is. Maybe when you, when you zoomed forward into the future and Stevie's 35, he's still sitting in that skate shop <laughs> talking to those dudes, you know? It could be like that. So <laughs> that'll be the sequel. So um, let's move on to the cast. Um, is there anything you, anything else you picked up on no. the movie? Well, I just think it was really enjoyable, and I don't identify with being a boy in California, a skateboarding boy in the 1990s. However, it tapped into a lot of, I think, just very common, maybe not of that age, because most people wouldn't be exposed to all that stuff at that age, but the feelings of, Going from childhood to not childhood, whatever that phase is in there. Yeah. In I'm, a harsh way. I'm very I think quickly. Because could, you could you apply it to anything. You know, children who are forced into other into other things, you know, at a young age. And yeah. I just think it was very relevant. So um, the cast here, Sonny Suljic plays Stevie. He's the main kid in the game. We saw him a couple of weeks ago in the house with the clock in its walls. He was the uh, kind of jerk kid in the school. <laughs> well, he was just, yeah, kind of. And um, the, the funny thing for me is, um, one of, you know, one of my favorite games of last year is God of War on the PlayStation. And he played the boy. Boy. <laughs> and he did all the motion capture and the voice. And the boy in God of War looks just like this kid. They didn't make him look different. They made him look like this kid with a bald head. So, whenever I look at him, I think of God of War, because I spent like 50 hours with that game. But uh, he's really good, right? Very good. I mean, he's new to the acting. He's not been in a ton of stuff. But I think he's really good. In this movie especially, it was like, there was a lot of, you know, when you see him smiling, because he's really like, this. I'm so happy, like, this is where I should be. Yep. Like, not in my bedroom with my brother beating me up. Actually here, speaking to these dudes who seem all right. Kept, you really saw that on it. Not just that he was smiling. It just looked like he was beaming. Like his, There was a lot of that. And then some of the hard scenes, like where he started to choke himself. I know. He just couldn't take it. No, this kid had some, you know, ha- what do you call it? Self-harm issues, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> a couple of times. But um, no, I really think he's a really one to watch. One to watch. Catherine Waterston, who I I love her. What do you think of her? She plays a mother. I mean, she was all right. We didn't see a lot of her. In, um, I, I, you know, Paul Thomas Anderson, I'm a massive fan. Inherent Vice is my least favorite Paul Thomas Anderson film. But if I have something I love about that movie, it's her. And she's, uh-huh. in, she's in that movie. Um, she's his girl, remember? I don't remember it much. Right. And she's awesome in it. And it was the one thing I took away from Inherent Vice. I don't know what the hell's going on, what the hell this story is, <laughs> but she is awesome. Uh, and here she is in this movie, and she is awesome. Again, she plays the mother, and she is a, a mother who's changing. Like, she, yeah. or she's, you know, she's changing. She's had a, let's say, a, she's not been the best mother for the, for the beginning of it. Because the the kids are kind of fucked up. But she wants them not to have, be fucked up. So. But that scene where she goes to the skate shop. <laughs> yeah. Because... I like when he's like, your mom is 
serious. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's so good. I, I love her, and uh, I'd like to see more of her. Um, Lucas Hedges, who we all know from Manchester in the Sea, Manchester by the Sea, and what else? Ladybird. Oh, true. He plays the brother Ian, and this brother you you can't really like him, can you? Mostly, no. He no. Is, he is just a shit. You know that scene where he comes to the skater guys and he's trying to be... Yep. Like, <laughs> that's really And fun. he's like, what? What? <laughs> it's actually funny, though, isn't it? The way he, like he's like... I'm but then in that confused. one moment when he's just punched his little brother and then he freaks out. No, like he can't even control it. He cannot right. cope with it He don't want to do it. I he can't think. cope with his whatever anger is in him just... I mean, again, not an excuse, but the way he played that particular scene, it was like gut-wrenching to be like, that's a whole other story of a whole other person coming of age right there. Yeah. That we're not watching except through his horrible treatment of his little brother. And you know, we've seen Lucas Hedges in Manchester by the Sea and mm-hmm. Lady Bird, and this character is very different to any of those. It's This character is very different. kind of angry and brooding. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, all well, we very, see. <laughs> very... Uh, um, now, the boys who play the skate boys who are in the shop, they're not actors. They are, I don't even know how they came about, like how he found them. But they are, and it, scenes with them in, it makes those scenes feel a particular way. The, you know what I'm saying? When you're watching a scene between Catherine Waterstone and Lucas Hedges, they're two very good actors and you can feel that. But these they're more ad libby or more non actorly, but in a good way. And there's four of them: Nacal Smith, who plays Ray, who I think's outstanding. Very good. Olan Prenat, who plays fuck shit. <laughs> Very good as well, because just really open and free with like. Yeah, and you could every you, scene. You really understand what he's about pretty yep. quickly. Uh, Gio, also broken hearted, but going a different direction with it. Right. Gio Galicia plays Ruben, and Ryder McLaughlin plays fourth grade. And they're all good in their own way, I think. Yep. Um, you know, the two main ones really are Ray and Fuckshit, I think. <laughs> they're the two kind of leaders of the group. And there's a bit of a, you know, they were best friends, and that friendship's also kind of dying. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Like, yeah. one of them gets an opportunity, and the other one is resentment, resentful about yeah, it. this... All the dynamics of this group are shifting kind of all the time. And and that's feeling. really the story of coming of age of anybody growing yeah. up. Yeah. And you, I think all four of those guys, especially Ray, and that scene where Ray sits Stevie down to tell him, it's almost like a father-son talk. Absolutely. Which Stevie doesn't ever get. Or right? brother. Brotherly. Talk, yeah, like, you know. like the brother that Stevie doesn't have. Correct. <laughs> like somebody who actually makes some sense. So... Yeah, there's a lot of good scenes between all these people. And, uh, you know, we haven't seen these dudes before because they've not been in anything else. But I really like them. This this is directed, did we mention, by Jonah Hill. You'll know Jonah Hill. He's uh, a... Jonas Hill, as I like to call him. You like to call him Jonas Hill. <laughs> I'm sure he would appreciate that. <laughs> um, but you know who Jonah Hill is. Super bad. Name the movies he's in. Super bad. Grandma's boy. <laughs> Grandma's boy. <body. laughs> That's why I don't like him because of that one movie. Right. So no offense, Jonas. Name movies that you really liked with him in though. Uh, Wolf, Wolf of, of Wall, Wall Street. Street. Yes. And the one we just watched. What oh, did we watch a movie with him? Don't worry, he won't get far on foot. Yes. Which actually, if you look closely, don't worry, he won't get far on foot. Which we reviewed recently. The boys from this movie are in <laughs> that movie because Jonah Hill was in that movie filming this movie at the same time. And those boys have a little scene in there. You, you, it's a wheelchair scene, let's say. That one also has a, a hint of this type of follow, not documentary, but, you know, right in there with the person sometimes. It's more produced it yeah. and more controlled, but it's still got a, a few scenes where you're just right in there, like right alongside with a little bit of shaky cam and... Trying to, like, identify with this character for who they are, whether you like them or not. Jonah Hill was really good in that. Mm-hmm. He was like this um, rich... <laughs> Weird, 
He Weird. put together a, a he group. He was a little hippy dippy. He was AA that he did the group for. Yeah, but like to help himself, like absolutely. <laughs> like, so, he, <laughs> so he feels better. But it was an interesting character, and when he actually came clean towards the end, that was really awesome. That scene. Mm-hmm. Um, extras on this Blu-ray, mid nineties. Um, there's there not very much actually. There's a commentary with Jonah Hill and the cinematographer, which I will definitely listen to. And there are some deleted scenes like um two deleted scenes one is the where he goes to the record shop to buy the cd that you know i i actually think that that scene should have been in the movie though to give you like how no i think it was done just right because you're already wanting this brother to be like hey thanks and he does nothing so i don't think you need any other right thing to go along with it to me anyway i thought it was right so yeah, that's um, that's all on mid nineties. Um, I love this movie. I-, I can see this being in my top movies of this year, and it's only what it's the second movie we watched. Yeah, I know, but I <laughs> something these kind of movies really they get me in some way. Well, you're gonna have to find one that doesn't, and then you won't have that bias anymore. <laughs> so um, yeah, I really really loved it, and I'd recommend it. Um, it's I'd like to see what Jonah Hill does next. You know, it's really cool seeing a new director yeah. you know come about like and see what they do because it's not what you know it's not it's kind of ballsy i think this movie is different oh yeah it's I not think... a, it's not something he's you can tell it's not something he's made for a commercial success it's not that kind of thing i mean he could have gone and made like some kind of you know screwball comedy and made millions of dollars off it this is more of a no, I want to tell this story, and, you know, I can do now, it. Who are these people who say there's no story here? It just blows my mind. Yes. Uh, like, are you intentionally trying to slam it? I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I do think there are some whole uh, factions out there who do that to movies. Like, oh, we hate Jonah Hill, so let's... But how can this, this not have a story? Like, This is full it. of story uh, and character development and... I mean, it's not like a sitcom or an episode of CSI where you, like, you're open with... The, no. the crime, and then you see everybody trying to solve it, and then you go to catch the bad guy. I mean, it's a different kind of story. Yeah, it's not like uh, it doesn't fit into the neat three-act thing. It's more of a But it does, a because you're introduced to him, you get to know him, you understand what his plight is, you meet what could potentially be his, you know, the challenge in his life, which is kind of navigating these young men, and is this going to be a big disaster or is it going to be life fulfilling? And then you get to see a bit of decision making going on a bit of like action and then more decisions have to be made. And then I don't know if it's a resolution, but is that are people just dumb? I don't, I don't, think, I don't think people can handle like when a movie just ends and it's not like got a bow on it. Exactly. You know, but it's like you're, uh, yeah. I mean, I like slice of life uh, yeah. stories telling because it's, it clues me into a, a bit of their story. Maybe that's the thing. I mean, there's more story to tell about these people. Right, exactly. But I don't need to know it. Right. Because <laughs> like, you get the gist of them. Yeah. Hmm. And the mystery of where they're going to end up is part of what makes it a good story. Yeah, and I don't think some people can take that. Like, they need, they need to know what happens. They need, they need the, the credits roll, and then it goes 20 years later, and here they all are doing the thing, like, you know. Right, yeah. That doesn't I happen. mean, I like that too sometimes if it fits the story you're telling me. Right. But. So, yeah. Like at I, the end of Bake Off when they like to tell us what everybody's up to. They, they don't do that anymore, <laughs> we've noticed. Just, well, they did on, what one of them still did, I think. Mm. So, um, well, I think we both recommend it. Yes. Um, well, I mean, to a specific people, but yeah. yeah. I think you might, if you know me by now and know kind of movies I like, it's that kind of movie and I like it. <laughs> um, so thanks to A24 and Lionsgate for sending us a copy for review. Next week we're looking at um, Ryan Gosling in First Man, which is, you know, an award season. The award seasons are starting. And this movie is possibly up for some awards and First Man. First Man is by Damien Chazelle, who... Also made La La Land, which I loved. And he's now making a space movie with Ryan Gosling. 
What's the eternal trivia question about La La Land going to be in every trivia quiz for all time? It's going to be, what movie <laughs> won the 2018 Oscars? Best picture. What movie didn't, but was awarded right. it for about 30 <laughs> seconds? That is the question, because the movie that did win was Moonlight. Correct. Both great movies, actually. So both both deserved it. Mm, disagree. But yeah, I'm looking forward to see it. Damien Chazelle also did Whiplash, which I really liked. And then he did La La Land, and now he's doing First Man. And, uh, you know, it's a story of Neil Armstrong, which is interesting to me. So, movie recommendations on the tip of mid-90s. I'll recommend you two movies if you like mid-90s. I will recommend Larry Clark's Kids from the 90s. That is a harsh movie. Very harsh. It's got the vibe of this movie a little bit. It goes. I, I, it's in the group of movies that if you want to feel really super depressed. Yes. Or And a mixture of depression and hopeful. Right. Strange com- combination at the end. It would be in there with like Manchester on the Sea. <laughs> <laughs> that is a hard. Even Moonlight. That's a tough one. Even yeah. though it's full of a hopeful thing about humanity. And yet it's just gut-wrenchingly sad and... They aren't pick me ups. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, kids is uh, very sad, <sighs> uh, very intense, and also very controversial for its mm-hmm. time, and probably still if you watch it now. I mean, there are child sex scenes. Even they're a bit more graphic than this one because mm-hmm. this one you don't see anything. Uh, and my other one is American Honey, which I will always recommend. It's Andrea Arnold's film. Always, like every single week. Yes. Mm, great. It's Andrea Arnold's <laughs> film from a year ago year and a half ago, American Honey. It's another movie similar to mid-90s. You're following some people. They're growing up. Things are not, you know, are just kind of flowing. Things are going and, you know, it might be it might be dramatic. It might be heartbreaking. It might be uplifting. It just all takes place. It's kind of like you're following some kids. Again, if you like a movie that's all wrapped up and tidy and has a happy ending, if you can't find the hopefulness in these tragedy stories, you, yeah, they're not for you. No. Kids in American Honey, I'm going to recommend. And, and then a Valium. And what? A Valium after, after you know, to, is it Valium? A Valium. <laughs> Maybe before. Just to make you feel better. <laughs> well, that just relaxes you. Yeah. I'd say well, drink a bottle of wine before. Get your tissues. You're going to cry because it's going to tap into your own humanity. And then you'll be broken. <laughs> yeah. And, and mine are? are, I'm going to start off the year, almost start off the year, with my recommendation, Wizard of Oz. Because it's kind of the opposite of this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I wanted, wanted to watch it this weekend, and I didn't do it. And then I was just thinking about it, like, it's just the opposite of these movies where I can sit like this one and completely be trans, like, or hypnotized by... Like the depth of pain that we cause each other and that we feel in life and how the hell do we all get through it? Like seriously? And yet we all just keep going. And then there's Wizard of Oz, which I watch and I'm just like, la 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 la, oh, oh, oh. you know, like it takes away all of that and you're just in the in a fantasy world. So I get why people love fantasy stuff, you know, well, cosplay yeah, Star Wars. and stuff like, no, I mean like cosplay and renaissance fair when you dress up and do i mean i'm too lazy to go that far but if i watch wizard of oz it can almost balance out manchester on the sea (laughs) or this movie or american honey american honey's not really sad or tragic it's just unsettling about you know the state that some people can find their lives being in or whatever and my other one is not a movie but it's the TV show from good old England called Mastermind. We've been watching it lately. Yeah. <laughs> Celebrity really Mastermind dumb. we've been makes watching. Makes you feel really dumb. It does like, you know. It's a BBC show. It's very difficult questions. It can be difficult and it can be simple. It could be like, who was the prime minister during World War II in England? And you're like, oh, I don't know. I can't think of it. And then it's like, oh, Winston Churchill. And you're like, oh, yeah. yeah. Right. It's a quiz Duh. show. It is, but it's challenging. I just find it funny that some of the people, they each get to pick a subject for their first little line of questioning. Some people pick, like, really obscure poets and, like, political war um, 
what are they called? Correspondents from World War One and things yeah. like that. Nobel Prize winners. And then someone picks Kim Kardashian, <laughs> Beyonce, Indiana Jones movies, you know. Yeah, Somebody they- needs to pick Tony Hawk. That'd be interesting. Yeah, well. But it's just questions about them and you, you don't even know what you know. Until what, somebody digs it up out of your brain. What I really like about it is it's no nonsense. It's not, you know, like American quiz shows and uh, other kind of quiz shows where even British ones where mm-hmm. they're all hyped up and it's all snazzy and this is not. And they don't even like fanfare these celebrities much. They just bring them on. They True. Don't, like, they don't, you know, it's not like, ooh, here's some celebrities. It's just like, no, here's four people. We'll tell you what charity. They, they don't even get a prize. It's for charity. And uh, is, there's no fanfare. It's like, hello, here's Mastermind. <laughs> Time to answer questions. And it's then fun. We go for questions. It's very fun, though. Yeah, so they're not trying to, like, hype it up. It's just this thing. It's been on for 40 years, I believe. So, yeah, that's Mastermind. A Scully stuff. I've been playing the Spider-Man DLC. Spider-Man, the game that came out on the PS4 last year. It's got some DLC, three chapters. I played the first chapter to 100%. It's the Black Cat chapter. Black Cat happens to be my favorite Spider-Man character. She is uh, Spider-Man's ex-girlfriend. There's obviously relationship things that crop up in this. Interesting. Um, Yeah, it's a bit more than just swinging around. You know, you meet up with Black Cat. She's doing some stuff. It's really good. Uh, It's This DLC is uh, three parts, and each part's about five hours long. Um... The story, the cutscenes, the voice acting is just the same as the the main game. So it's not like they made it like a cheap rip-off. It's just as good. Uh, I've played like the first bit. I'm looking forward to playing the second two parts, which cover two different characters that you meet in the main game, but they don't really cover. So uh, yeah, it's the Spider-Man DLC. Also, I played this week, Resident Evil 2 is getting a remake. I'm not talking about like a... like making it high definition. I'm talking about they made a new Resident Evil 2, like, from the ground up. Now, there is a demo on Steam. It's also on Xbox and PS4. But the demo is, like, a very unique thing. You get 30 minutes in the demo, and once the 30 minutes expires, the demo is over and you can't play it again. It's called the one-shot demo. So you have to make your 30 minutes count. And you saw it, didn't you? It's, it's, yeah. It's really awesome looking, right? It's like... Modern Resident Evil. It doesn't look like a game from 20 years ago. It's all brand new. Did it give you the same feeling? Well, it gave me the feeling of I played the 30 minutes and then instantly was like, yes, I would buy that. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That is Resident Evil, what I like. It's like Resident Evil 7 that I really enjoyed, the new one. But it's the it's the second one, remade. But it ain't just remade like I was reading about it yesterday. They didn't just make it look better they've actually redone all the lines wrote the script again and you know like if you think well i played resident evil 2 the original one like 50 times so i know exactly where everything is well all the things are in different places so it's not like oh i'm gonna walk past this window and something's gonna jump through and i won't be scared no it won't come through that window it'll come somewhere else where you're not expecting it right So, so they have made it for people who are big fans of the original who have played it to death and know every inch of it. They've made it for them as well as people who might not remember Resident Evil 2 or maybe didn't play it. Because it came out on PlayStation 1 and it would have been in the 90s, like this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and it... I mean, this is a, this is a looks like a modern video game. But if you love Resident Evil, uh, it's a new Resident Evil. I'm excited because I think Resident Evil is one of m- the best game franchises it always makes me scared i like that movies don't make me scared at all you know but playing resident evil i jump a lot true you do get more freaked out it makes me jump like i I physically have reaction to it i can be walking down a corridor and it's all spooky and you know it looks all creepy and i'm like i know something's coming i I know i'm i'm ready i'm ready and then it always comes at the moment i'm not expecting it and i jump and i jumped at this demo there was a body hanging up from the ceiling. And I was like, oh, body hanging up from the ceiling. Why is that body hanging up from the ceiling? I go over and look at it. Nothing happens. I walk past it and it falls down behind me and <laughs> makes a horrible noise. So I was like, oh. <laughs> so yeah, that's Resident Evil 2, the remake. It actually comes out on January the 25th, 
but you can pick up the demo for free. It's on Steam, it's on PS4, it's on Xbox. Try it for 30 minutes. I guarantee if you're into this kind of game, you'll like it. What's for dinner, said Doc? Mm, rice and vegetables. That sounds very dull. <laughs> what did you make it? There you go. There's your choice. No, I mean, what do ri- you want? Rice and vegetables. Just, I mean, you know, you think this, I'm gonna make something dull? No, I mean, I, I know what you're making, but the listeners do not. Yeah, well, it's gonna be rice and vegetables. I mean, to them, they're like, they can see this <laughs> pile of ri- white rice and like some peas on the side. Well, then they have zero imagination <laughs> because that's not. How I cook. How would you... What do you think I'm going to do to it? I think you'd probably make some... Put some herb... Like curry spices and stuff. Correct. In the rice. Correct. Brown up the vegetables nice. Yeah, and stir it into the rice. Correct. Yeah. Maybe even... Maybe even make it into uh, egg fried rice. Oh, yes. See? Then you get all excited. (laughs) All right, so what is your advice before we leave? Um, My advice is... And a lot of people seem, I don't know if they're just chicken shit or they've been brainwashed in their life to be afraid, but like, it's okay to question people when they tell you something. Ooh, what was that little noise? I don't know. Excuse me. Excuse me. It's okay when someone gives you a bit of information for you to go, mm, I'm not sure about that. What is your source? Where did you hear that? Where did you learn that? Where can I look that up? And it could be anything. I don't mean just current politics because that'll make your head spin. Always look up that shit. But just anything. If somebody at work comes along and says, oh, I heard so-and-so is going to do this and that and we're going to have this and that. And you'd be like, uh, even if it's your manager, if you have some reason to doubt it, there is absolutely nothing wrong with questioning it. Like, if they've built a culture in where you work or in your family or wherever you are where it's almost dangerous for you to say something, that's different. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about everyday life where people are just kind of chicken shit. I don't want to rock the boat. But then you sit there and you're either convinced of something that's completely inaccurate because now you're an idiot just taking anything anybody says for the truth or you're sitting there and it gnaws away at you and you, you, you know... It can ruin the trust you have in a person, too, if you don't confront it and say, hey, how did you hear that? If they genuinely believe it and you both then find out it's incorrect together, then they might also want to know that. So it's okay to question what people tell you. Very nice. Unless it puts your life at risk. That's different. We are all grown ups here. We know what I'm talking about. Well said. Thank you. So you can uh, check us out on aschoolie.com or sitto.com, Twitter, Facebook. You can catch the podcast itself on the Google Play Store, the iTunes Music Store, TuneIn Radio. You can, If you've got an Amazon device, just say your trigger word, listen to After the Show podcast on TuneIn. It will play the latest My trigger word is, word is cake. That will trigger me to want cake. You can catch this also <laughs> on iTunes if you use an Apple device. Who uses an Apple device? <laughs> Somebody Anybody? must. Somebody does. Um, you can also catch us on YouTube. You make that sound like Apple products are so old-fashioned. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, who uses Apple products? Email, if you use email, you can email me at ascully at ascully.com. You don't email Sid Talk at any address because she You really... can if you got gardening tips or baking tips. Because yeah. yesterday I baked some kick-ass bread. But generally she despises the law of you. <laughs> I don't despise anyone. There's no one that I despise that I can think of off the top of my head. And um, you know what? Stay classy, Mr. Jonah Hill. You did a very good job here. Jonas Hill. I'm not the super greatest fan of Jonah Hill either, but I like what he's doing with this directing job. So stay classy. I feel like he's going to be a powerhouse guy someday. Uh, yeah, and I'm going to say think for yourself, because if you don't do it, somebody's definitely doing it for you. <laughs>